And okay, we are recording. Okie dokie. So, um, just a right. minute. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, if, as I say, if there's anybody in the meeting who doesn't want their image to appear on the video, and I'm assuming that all you authors want to be seen, a um, bit of good publicity, um, then please switch your video off now because we do record the meeting to post on YouTube. Um, so that's good. And uh, let me, I'm going to mute all of you, but Colin, Yes. Right. So, Colin, I'm going to ask you to unmute. OK. Um, actually, no, I won't unmute. No, all, all unmute, please, because um, you're going to have to do some clapping in a minute. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, just for a mo. OK, brilliant. All right. So um, it's a bit of a game, this, isn't it? <laughs> OK, so, um, so hello, everybody, and welcome to the May 2021 edition of Fiction Fix Online. We finally got here. So this event is being live streamed to the Finger on the Pulse, which is the Facebook group for Fiction Fix Online, and the Zoom video will be posted afterwards on my Helen Claire Gould's channel on YouTube. So please subscribe and point all your friends towards it. <laughs> Very cheeky, I know. Um, and anybody can join the finger on the pulse. You don't have to be a reader. You could be a listener. Um, so anybody can join. Um, uh, obviously, if people started posting something political or irrelevant, I'd probably say, well, yeah. maybe not. <laughs> Um, anyway, so apparently the stream no longer appears on my timeline, but if you wish to join the finger on the pulse, just request to do so. And um, there are a few rules to review and some questions to answer, but the group is, as I say, for both readers and listeners. And at our Fiction Fix live events, there are all, there's always a books table. Now, we can't do that with Fiction Fix online, so authors please do post your book details in the chat and if you have a website please include it and a link to the ebook or seller for the print version and um so for example i would say oh you know you could get print version from um uh, waterstones or whatever prices would be helpful and an isbn or uh, a sin number if you have it on Amazon, the ASIN will take pe uh, people straight to the book. I discovered this last week. So this can be done any time during um, this afternoon. And I will post the information with the video or in, probably in the comments if below it. So also, um, yes, if you've got a website, post a note of that and if you're lucky enough to be independently or traditionally published you can post that site if you have your own oh somebody else right joshua uh he's joining yeah that's all right okay okay so the, in a minute, the, uh, oh yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Just see what, what happens. <laughs> I, I'm guessing that Joshua is uh, somebody's relative or friend. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I thought I recognised the name actually. And my son. <laughs> it's your son, Melissa. Yeah. Right. That's fabulous. Yeah. Apologies for being late. <laughs> That's all right. That's okay. Um, you will be muted most of the time, but we would like you to clap. So if you can un unmute yourself, you know, when when we get to that point, that would be great. We will do. Um, um, and there, there's a chat afterwards, so you can stay for that if you've got time and chat to all of us then. Okay. Um, 
So listeners, please feel free to copy down any details that you'd like to from the chat. And if you're watching but not in the audience, which has been a bit of an experiment this time, I will post the details in the Finger on the Pulse Facebook group after Fiction Fix has finished and on my YouTube channel when I post the video there and also on LinkedIn and my web website. Before we start, I would like to dedicate this edition of Fiction Fix to a fellow writer who I've recently learned has died during lockdown. There's somebody who lived in Peterborough. I met a lady called Viv Foster when she came to the first ever Storytelling for Writers workshop that I ran. And it was at a time when I just started Fiction Fix and she soon became a much respected friend. She was mostly known for her wonderful poetry, but she also wrote some fantastic stories, including some science fictional ones. And she read one of her stories at an early fiction fix when we were based in the Draper's Arms in Peterborough. And we also met at poetry events and she was always very supportive of fiction fix and its aims. She was a lovely lady and I'm really sorry that she's no longer with us. So mm -hmm. farewell, my friend. You were a colourful part of the Peterborough literary culture and we will remember you with love and respect. So now... Colin is going to kick off the session by reading the next instalment of his ongoing fantasy series for us. So will you please give a big hand to Colin A. Brett and Milo. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this isn't the next instalment. This is the first instalment. So. Big pardon. <laughs> OK. Right. Rest here, you weary traveller. Summer had been and gone. Oh, oh, sorry. Colin, you need to unmute. Sorry, I've... Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Rest here, you weary traveller. Summer had been and gone. Autumn rains had muddied the fields for the last week, and now winter was threatening a long, long stay in the village of Hessard's Ford. The inn was busier than Milo had seen for several months. Trading caravans had been sparse during the summer, unsurprising given the rumours of war in the Southlands, and the, only the weekly market in the village had kept the inn running. But earlier today, a three-wagon caravan had arrived in Hessard's Ford and caused such stir that gossip was rife. The caravan was bound for the city and had been attacked by orc raiders only two days' travel from Hessard's Ford. Two days! That sort of violence had been unheard of for nearly 10 years. The orc settlements in the foothills of the mountains had been relatively peaceful, occasionally trading iron ore at Hessard's Ford Market. To be fair, these visits had resulted in several extreme bar brawls and two deaths, but nothing otherwise unexpected. Milo had stabled the caravan's horses and cleaned the mud and sweat slick coats. As the wagons had been parked outside the inn, he had noticed where arrows and crossbow bolts had struck the wooden sides and later been prized from the wood. And was that a blood stain on the rear boards? The boy shuddered. Now that night had drawn in, the inn was heaving with villagers and the dozen newly arrived guests. Milo was taking a breather from his first stint of the night. He'd been running back and forwards between the bar, the kitchen, the common room, bringing hot meals, fuel for the roaring fire and flagons of dark local ale. He leaned back against the bar and turned to Callie, one of the girls who would arrive with the caravan. Her pale face framed with raven curls and her eyes a deep sapphire blue marked her as an Imerian, one of the northern countries. Milo played the bewildered country bumpkin. What brings you here at this time of the year? You're a long way from home. Callie flicked a glance towards the hearth where several of the men, several of the caravan were seated, surrounded by villagers. A middle-aged man, his hair grey and his face florid from the heat and ale, was regaling, regaling the audience with the story of the journey and the horrific orc attack. That's my father, she said. This run was supposed to be the last of the year. We left Kenilin with ten wagons loaded with bolts of silk, worth a fortune at home, and enough guards to keep us safe. The girl paused and looked down at her feet. Orc battle cries echoed through her head as she recalled the attack. At least we thought they would keep us safe. 
Milo knew what an orc attack could do. He remembered cowering in the woodshed of his parents' farm, the ruins of which were about half a day's travel from Hessard's ford. Trying not to cry as he saw his mother, father and three farmhands slaughtered by two dozen orcs. That's not something a six-year-old boy should have seen. They didn't give us a chance, Callie continued in a small voice. They attacked from ambush. Our guards fought back, of course. I saw two of the raiders fall, but for each orc killed, it seemed five of our men, good Imerian soldiers, each of them died. The sergeant lashed away the horses of my wagon and drove them for away from the fighting. It took me over an hour to get the team back under control. But then I was miles away from the battle and couldn't find my way back to help our men. My host stifled the thoughts he'd been entertaining about Callie. She would have been another notch in the beam of the stable's hairloft, but not now. He noticed lines of grief around Callie's eyes, lines which a 16-year-old girl, young woman now, he corrected himself, should not have possessed. What did they look like, he asked. Yorks, I mean. Callie looked into My Milo in the eyes. He had an open, honest face, a mop of fair hair, and, she admitted, a cute smile. They were orcs, savages. I've seen an orc trading delegation in Avanti before. They were heavily armed and armoured, which is against the law in our city. We relaxed the rules to allow them to trade the iron and copper they had mined. But they were known to have very hot temper. She looked away, back towards her father. The raiders, Milo prompted gently. Callie thought back, overcoming her reluctance to remember the worst. They wore black and steel plate armour and were armed with the cruelest looking swords I've ever seen. Weapons with a serrated edge so sharp it cut through our soldiers' chainmail like it was silk. Details swam through the head, her head now. Their shields had spikes instead of a central boss and were blazoned with what looked like a ravening wolf's head. They're not locals, thought Milo. The York towns and mining sites within a week's travel of Hessard's Ford had nothing the human population would recognise as an army, nor even formal garrisons. They were at best militia, at, at worst the, site, the kind of cutthroats that had destroyed his parents' farm. But what, would he, what could he do? Milo himself was only 16, barely a man and certainly not the hero or dedicated soldier who could have tracked and destroyed the orcs. Hey, boy, said a soft voice, which interrupted Milo's train of thought. He looked up at the Callie's smiling face, a hint of mischief in her eyes. Tell me, she said, why did they call you that? You've been running around all night and all I've heard them call you is boy. Even my own people have taken to calling you that. You haven't even told me your name. Milo, he replied. It's Milo. He looked into Callie's deep blue eyes. The girl was serious now, with no hint of the taunting and teasing the men around the fire usually showed. I've been here since I was six. The boss took me under his wing. No one really cared what my name was. They'd shout boy and I'd come running. I carried this, cleaned that, served the food, fixed what was broken. I got used to being called boy. Just boy. He finished with a shrug and half-heartedly looked around the common room to see if any customers needed fresh drinks or a slab of roast meat. Callie's next question was drowned out in the uproar from around the fire. Hey, boy! One of the village men shouted. We're dicing over here. Get these tables cleared. And there you go. Thank you very much for listening. Right. So um, Colin organises the technical side of this live stream. So many thanks to him for that. And um, could you please unmute and let's give a round of applause for Colin A. Brett and Milo. Thank you. Right. Sorry. Okay. So um, this afternoon, we've got four new readers for you. And our next reader this afternoon is Kirsty Wishart, who is a debut author. And her mm. new book is called The Knitting Station. And it's set in Scotland, so very intriguing. So will you please give a warm welcome to Kirsty Wishart with her novel, The Knitting Station. Yeah, I'm just going to read the first few pages of the, the start of the novel, um, which is set in the early 1960s. The night before the voyage to Tharn in our cold Aberdeen B&B &B bed, 
Hannah dozed and her head filled with mushroom clouds. Dozens of them blossomed with a slow and terrible grace over a plateau, the sky turning a virulent red atomic orange. The terror of the sight faded as those large fluffy clouds shrank and sank, grew four short hooved legs apiece. Black sheep's heads thrust out one end with piercing eyes of radioactive yellow, while stubby white tails wagged at the other. Their joyful baas crescendoed as they neared the curiously unscorched grass and on landing they gambled, leapt over the ineffective fences. Hannah awoke with a start, scarcely knew whether to laugh or cry. She'd half a mind to run to Dr Fredrickson's room and tell him what harm his awful plan had already inflicted on her damaged subconscious. Attempting to keep calm, she listened to the restless breath of her roommate, Maisie, one of the three other patients brought along as part of this mad experiment. Maisie twittered and mumbled, but at least she was asleep and Hannah didn't want to wake her for the sake of some sheep-infested nightmare. Clutching her candlewick blanket, she focused on the solidity of her narrow bed in contrast to the watery conditions to be faced tomorrow. What had she been thinking? She cursed the doctor's charm, the way she'd been swept along by his enthusiasm for a new radical treatment involving knitting therapy, portraying the group as experimental pioneers advancing medical history. The prospect of getting away from the confines of the Institute had also been attractive, and she got into the way of thinking of it as a holiday, albeit one with an insistence on handicrafts being undertaken. But now, with the world on the brink of nuclear disaster, Kennedy's a hair's breadth away from war on Russia, being whisked away from the civilised environs of Edinburgh, well, the Institute on the outskirts, to an island so small it warranted not a speck on maps of the North Sea seemed ridiculous. Especially as she'd be spending two months in a place with the population of sheep outnumbered humans five to one. And to do what? Knit. Knitting. This was how she was expected to spend her time. Not writing to MPs, the newspapers, protesting, agitating. No. Instead, she would be improving her skills at casting off. Falling asleep against a pillow as comfy as a tea tray, her sob sounded bleat like. The next day, stepping over the threshold of the low ceilinged passenger cabin of a tiny Tharnbound ferry, Hannah gripped Maisie's arm at the sight confronting her. Because among the wooden benches were sheep. A small herd dotted about, the sheer wrongness of them in an enclosed space surrounded by sea making it difficult to count. That and it felt cheeky to do so, as this particular breed was a good deal less cheery than the fluffy flock of last night. They regarded the new arrivals in unnerving silence, yellow eyes filled with bored contempt, a uh, who let you aboard disdain. Worried this was a panic-induced hallucination, Hannah whispered, Maisie, those sheep, they are. There, aren't they? If this was some sort of woolly vision, Hannah had to admit her subconscious had outdone itself by including olfactory effects, the smell of a barn enveloping them. Not that she'd ever visited a barn, but this would surely be the aroma tickling the back of her throat if she did. A thick woolly fog of damp fleece and hay, warm dung and a musky earthliness that should have been unpleasant but wasn't. In fact, as she breathed in deeply, it proved a comfort a distraction from the timbers shivering beneath her feet. On the far side of the cabin next to Alfie and Gordon sat the doctor and he waved them to the bench opposite. Gordon had hunched up his lankiness, hands tucked into his oxters, knees up to his ears. He appeared as cadaverous as death in a huff, although with more hair, the tonsure of black ringing his baldness, slightly too long for anyone to mistake him for a monk. Even Alfie, the human spark plug, was subdued, eyes wide against his surroundings. His finger tugged at the collar of his shirt beneath his woolly jumper, like a condemned man checking his noose. There were fewer outbursts than usual, though, only the occasional overboard escaping. Naturally, the doctor was content, and he bore the air of a sophisticated ship's captain in his Homburg and grey astrakhan coat. His retown solidity, distinguished beard and wonderfully neat gold spectacles offered comfort. Dear ladies, please join us and do take care not to startle the livestock. 
Hannah frowned, gave a determined nod as the doctor's remark confirmed, yes, those sheep were there, and gingerly led Maisie around a ewe, standing steadfast in the central aisle. Once they'd passed, it turned with remarkable speed to follow their progress. When they sat, it snickered, grinning with teeth tough enough to grind through heather, and Hannah wondered at the damage they'd do to a finger. Bundled together on the bench, Maisie asked, do you think they bite? <laughs> Hannah felt ill-equipped to supply confidence, cold spray licking the back of her shorn neck, its source presumably the porthole above her head. Thankfully, it was too high to grant a view of the white-capped waves and predatory seagulls waiting beyond the cosy confines of Aberdeen Harbour. The moisture had turned Maisie's blonde locks even frizzier than usual, and with her wide pale eyes, she bore a striking resemblance to patients who recently suffered one of the Institute's electrifying cures. Well, probably not, Hannah replied, disconcerted by the beast who'd fixed her with a demonic stare. The doctor leant forward, patted Maisie's knee, chuckled, no, no, my dear, I'm assured they are quite tame, at least by Tharn standards. Now, might I suggest to calm your nerves you undertake some knitting? Practice before you enter the stewardship of Madame Jean. If you can knit at sea, his voice rose, the ferry bouncing as the engine thrummed, you can knit anywhere. Thank you. Right, would you all like to unmute and we'll... Um, <laughs> that is brilliant. Really nice bit of writing there. So please make some noise for Kirsty and the knitting station. Hmm, there's quite a few initiatives like that in the health service at the moment as well, I gather. Well, they have been, yeah, the gardening seems to be very big at the moment. Yeah. Well. Uh, maybe yeah. that will feature in the sequel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So, and now we welcome all the way from St. Louis in America, Raymond Parrish with his crime novel, Overnight Delivery. And I gather that he's working on a sequel as well. So now I'd like to introduce to you Raymond Parrish and Overnight Delivery. Thank you. Morning from St. Louis. <laughs> yeah. I was chalking up the noise to a dream hangover when I heard a second distinguishable squeak not just the sounds of the inching shift in temperature. This was weight coming down on the ever-present warp in the floorboards, just inside the front door. The third and sixth planks. I've been making that sound every time I came through the entryway and toward the stairs since day one of my move. Awake, not alone. I sat up, fear thundering into my ears and delivering energy to my legs. I stepped onto the carpet, and rushed toward the open doorway of Haley's room. Dread, not yet translating into caution. The thick pile consumed the noise of my steps. I slid against the wall next to the doorway and strained to listen through an urge to scream. A dull thud of soft soled shoes echoed through the darkness. My mind made its best and worst guess. Preacher or Jake? Preacher and Jake. Without waking me, he or she or them had beaten the lock, not knowing the planks were a secondary alarm system. A bit too late, the intruder heard it too. An awkward attempt at stealth called me back from frantic. The well-traveled wooden stairs were another percussive alarm system, unknown to the feet moving my way. I counted the squeaks in my head. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The prowler had reached the first landing and the doorway to my bedroom. Silence. The carpet in my room. Gathering some semblance of focus, it hit me that standing in the dark while the attacker found an empty room, then continued to climb, wasn't a viable plan. Whoever was creeping through the house knew I was here and saw the lights go out. I grabbed at the pockets of my jeans. No phone left on the bed. Another groan of heft hit the stairs. The stalker had found me missing and was back on the landing moving this way. If they'd been watching my movements and knew my schedule, they would assume Haley had been in the back seat and settled in here for the night. Whoever this was planned on coming to her room to find me or us. 
too late for the phone, no way to get down the stairs through the creeper. If it was Jake, he'd fill the whole stairwell. If it was Preacher, he'd just look at me and I'd have a heart attack. I desperately <laughs> looked, looked around for anything resembling protection. The hammering of my heart intensified by a compressed explosion in my head, no less terrified, but with a monstrous rage beginning to possess my body. Triggered further from the door, I backed into Haley's dresser and nudged the hard plastic of her portable CD player sitting on top, probably still loaded with the hot new Cassie Simmons CD. Something I, maybe I could hit the play button. Maybe the saccharine pop music will drive him away. Ordering on silent hysteria, I grabbed the handle. It wasn't much, but there were no other choices. I reached behind the player and disconnected the cord from the back panel. As I lifted it, the cord slipped from my hand and I heard the faint, sickening clunk of the plug knocking on wood, bouncing off the dresser and settling onto the carpet. It wasn't a big sound, just enough to cause a hesitation, followed by accelerated footsteps in the hazy cast of a cell phone flashlight increasing in strength as it led the prowler up the stairs. In retrospect, I saw Jake's stomach come through the door before I saw the rest of him. His paunch and the handgun with a funny barrel extension poking through the portal. Bracing my feet at shoulder width, I hefted the CD player with both hands, aimed for what I hoped was the middle of his body and swung left to right with every ounce of electric energy my frame could muster. Huh. I nailed him square in the chest as he stepped into the room. He staggered backwards, his light released into the night. The gun went off, making a quieter sound than I expected as a bullet embedded itself somewhere in the slanted ceiling. I pivoted into the doorway as Jake stumbled backwards. His heel must have caught on the edge of the stairs. My blow alone could not have shifted his massive weight. Without a word, arms pinwheeling, he catapulted onto his back and bounced violently down to the first landing. Jake was stunned, flailing like a giant overturned tortoise, his girth making it difficult to maneuver in the tight space. I hoped his head had knocked on wood on each step. It was too dark to tell. He was, however, a professional, a Neanderthal, and surprisingly fast for an overweight turtle. Almost immediately, he fought to regain his feet. I rushed down the stairs as Jake was finding his sea legs. He staggered upright and lurched toward me. The gun was gone from his hand. It didn't matter. If this animal got a grip on me, he'd simply crush my spine. The stairwell didn't allow for a full swing of the CD player. In full lizard brain, I threw myself from the steps with the machine right in front of me like a battering ram, smashing Jake square in the face as he raised his head. With a grotesque squishing noise of hard plastic on flesh, and another muted grunt. Jake spun to his left, grasping at air as he was launched backwards down the remaining stairs. My feet hit the landing and something in my an left ankle gave way. Not being a man with a lifetime of experience giving and receiving pain, I screamed, stumbled, pitched to the right and followed Jake down the stairwell to the first floor. The makeshift weapon flew from my hands I arrived at the bottom of the crosswise on top of my assailant, his ample torso, a partial cushion for the crash. My eyes slammed closed as my head pounded the hardwood. It took painful effort to reopen them. Through the cascade of nausea and blurred vision, I was staring directly into Jake's face. His eyes, also open, were blank and unblinking. I noticed that his nose was pushed sideways, bloody flattened by the blow. His head tilted at an odd angle. He looked as if he was considering a question for which there was no answer. I had no previous experience with this sort of thing, but guessed he was dead. I rolled off the body and landed with a soft thud on the unyielding oak. Damn, my head was spinning, everything hurt. I did the sensible thing and closed my eyes again. You amaze me, Doc. My brain barely registered the sudden awareness that the speaker could not be Jake. I forced my eyes open a second time. Preacher. 
He stood in the doorway, shaking his head, shifting his gaze from his ex-partner to me. I lay completely still, no fear left, just pain. I get a real doctor to check out those injuries, Doc, he monotoned. You came down real hard. He knelt, checked Jake's neck for a pulse, then picked up the gun that had managed to careen its way down to his feet. I'll just take this with me if you don't mind. He stood, leaned over, picked up the coat rack, an apparent casualty of the battle, and set it upright in the exact correct position. Then he took in the entire scene once more and shook his head again in apparent disbelief. He stepped slowly backwards, gingerly leapfrogging the offending creaky boards, turned the door handle, and stepped into the night, gently closing the door behind him. At some point, I pulled myself to my knees and, head in a firestorm, crawled up the stairs to retrieve my cell phone. Later, I wouldn't remember dialing 911 or how I got back down the stairs. Thank you. Right. Would you like to unmute everybody? <laughs> and let's hear it for Raymond Parrish and overnight delivery. Okay. Right. So next up is Andrew Sweet, who sneaked in a little while ago. <laughs> um, he's also from over the pond and he runs a writer's group in Seattle and I can't remember the exact name. Would you like to enlighten us, please? Uh, sure, that's Greater Seattle Area sure. Writers. Is it, am I coming across too loud? Right. It's okay. No, it's fine, it's fine. Perfect. That sounds good. Okay, so um, Andrew's going to read from his second novel, which is Bodhi Rising. So will you please put your hands together for Andrew Sweet reading from his science fiction novel, Bodhi Rising. Well, thank you. Thank you, Helen, for putting this together. I really appreciate it. Um, all right, I'm going to start with chapter, with uh, what was chapter two, but it's now chapter one. The Dying Boy, Tuesday, June 2nd, 2201. Bodhi survived on the knowledge that if he died right now, his mother would be equal parts guilt-ridden and angry. He had been stupid not to bring enough extra food. The disease that ravaged his body stalked him through the halls of a thick-walled mansion just outside of Winnipeg, Canada. He scowled, realizing that he can no longer recall how to navigate the monstrosity of a home. His supporting hands slipped against the white marble walls, struggling to keep his body upright and his thin shoulders slackened as he neared a potential exit. He slowed to listen for voices, hoping that it led to freedom, confused and directionless in his weakened state. But he lifted his head and strained to distinguish among the sounds emanating through the pale ivory door. He distinguished the high rich tone of his mother's voice and Aiden's deeper masculine vocalizations as they drifted in from the garden outside. The sound of a United States newscast lay beneath. He pushed against the cold metal, swinging the door outward and revealing four overgrown stairs descending toward a garden as anemic of vegetation as its body was of iron. Any discussion ceased when he crossed over the threshold, but he stiffened his back and let out his breath slowly. They had been talking about him again. That probably meant another course of treatment that wouldn't work. Bodhi's mother swept dark black hair away from her hazel eyes and smiled up at him from where she'd been pulling weeds. Hey, buddy, how are you? A different question hid beneath the veneer of simple greeting. She wanted a rundown of his physiological condition to determine how anxious she should be for the day. His head began to swim as the temporary effects of his backup chocolate bar faded faster. If he didn't get more food soon, or a session with the damn erythropoietin pump to boost his failing kidneys, he would collapse. He refused to give her the ammunition to lock herself into a downward emotional spiral. Woody pushed his lips up at the corners to reassure, but his knees failed him. He repositioned his feet to stabilize himself. Woody's shoes found no purchase, and he tumbled forward headlong toward the dry, rocky dirt. His mother screamed. Aiden rose to lunge for him, but the man was too far away and too slow. The last thing Woody saw was the ground advancing toward his head. Awake. A fire burned between his eyes. 
The world brightened before him with natural sunlight and warmth as the flash blindness waned. He closed his eyes against the repetitive thud of pain in his forehead, diminishing as the grogginess stripped from his mind. Reopening them, he looked to his left where his haptic gear lay, an invitation to escape from reality. The nearby erythropoids and pump caught his attention next. This resembled a swag light hanging overhead, issuing forth vibrations that, on some level, told his body to produce more blood cells. His cheeks flushed and he gritted his teeth. Weeks of effort to gain autonomy over his life evaporated due to an inept sense of direction. Collapsing before his overprotective mother would siphon away what was left of his freedom. He rolled over toward his haptic rig. Don't even think about it, Bodhi, came his mother's voice from the opposite direction. Startled at not having seen her, he turned back over and tried to gauge how angry she was. Her eyebrows furrowed over her eyes, set against her sandstone brown skin. Her fixed jaw usually meant that nothing he told her would matter. He gulped and tried anyway. Mama just got lost, that's all. Embarrassment flashed through him and his cheeks grew hot. Anger flared in his mind at what he knew was coming. He'd made yet another mistake. You got lost? I went exploring and took a wrong turn. That's all that happened. She sighed and her jaw loosened slightly. It would hurt you to be more careful. He had been, but he couldn't tell her about the two backup chocolate bars that had lasted less than 30 minutes between them. Nor could he share that even when they did work to give him energy, the mental clarity was hit or miss. In Aiden's half underground mansion, the walls all looked the same when his mind went fuzzy. To tell her that would mean that his condition had deteriorated and he wouldn't do that to her. But now she would find out anyway. Later, alone and feeling a little stronger under the pump, Bodhi mentally prepared for what he knew would come next. The best and worst thing about living with Aiden was that Aiden could afford to have a doctor on site at all times. Every time Bodhi's illness flared, the doctor appeared on the scene almost immediately. The routine checkups and interviews that happened weekly remained tedious, but worse were the visits when Bodhi hurt himself. The doctor didn't even knock, but barged into Bodhi's room with his mother in tow. Despite the doctor's ongoing feud with his mother over formality, Bodhi liked the man. His crooked teeth beneath a cold black bold cut of hair could be off-putting when he wasn't expected. Mrs. Perriam, the doctor addressed his mother and Bodhi felt her reaction before it erupted from her mouth. Rawls, she corrected. He always made the same mistake as though he insisted that Aiden and his mother be married. The doctor ignored her and engaged in an examination which involved a lot of wand waving around Bodhi's body and questions about his exhaustion. Your son can't keep his blood count up. We knew that already, she scowled at him. It's gotten worse, Mrs. Perry. Rawls, doctor, it's Miss Rawls. Aiden and I are still not married. Again, he gave her no response. Can I speak to you in private? But he started up from his bed to leave the room and make his way to the virtual reality jump point down the hall. He was still sore from the previous day's fall, but he could use some escape time. Or before he reached the door, Buddy's mother grabbed him by the arm and pulled him back. No, you stay, you're 15. You need to know what's happening to your body. Go on, doctor. The doctor shifted his weight, uh, shifted his weight and stammered as he began. Very well. Even the erythropoietin pump isn't keeping up. Its effects seem to be wearing off. His body, the man stopped for a moment and turned to Bodhi directly. Your body is shutting down. The increasing, shakiness, uh, the increasing shakes and seizures are signs of advanced degenerative muscle and nerve disease. The lack of oxygen is starving it. Your life expectancy is lower than it says on your chart of all the recent changes. Bodhi's heart skipped and he leaned forward. To what? Bodhi whispered. The doctor pulled his lips into a tight line. One year, maybe less. Bodhi's mother's hand shot up to cover a gas. She drew her head backward and stared at Bodhi with glassy eyes. His, life, his expected lifespan had just been sliced in half. Mom, it's okay. He tried to reassure her, the words falling empty from his mouth as he processed. She only shook her head at his tongues. Don't do that, she said. Nothing about this is okay. For Bodhi, the moment was fuzzy and distant. The idea that he could be dead before his 16th birthday seemed ludicrous. Many assumptions about how his future would unfold crashed down around him. Part of him had expected to meet someone and fall in love. A family he would never have disappeared before his eyes. And somewhere in the back of his mind, a voice told him to be upset and to rage. But it was small and hidden and easy to ignore as all the feeling drained out of him. But he stared up at the ceiling and imagined that he was free of his body, flying over the trees. He longed for that type of freedom with the sky stretching before him and the warmth of the sun on his back. Then he tried another coping technique of his endless supply. He imagined running through the forest in a body that never tired. He dove into a lake in his mind, 
feeling the cool rush of water as he slid through it. The dirt beneath his healthy feet gripped as he walked, clawing him to the earth. Thick muscular legs carried his broad shoulders. He jumped and soared up into the sky and landed a few minute, meters away. It took no more energy than to blink. But when his eyes drifted back down and landed on his mother, her tears were still there and his life was still over. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Okay, so a big hand, please, for Andrew Sweet and his novel, Bodhi Rising. Okay. And it's the second in a series begun with Models and Citizens. The, the um, cover that you've seen on the poster is actually from that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Are you, are you re rejigging the cover on Bodhi Rising? Um, I I have the cover, but it, it just got finished. It wasn't ready for the for this. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's fab. Okay. And is that out yet, or? Oh, uh, Bodhi Rising comes out. The, uh, oh, it's May already. This month, actually, May thirtieth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll post some uh, information I think, about it. I think that we've got. Got a bit confused because of me having that accident and having to move this on to today. Right. So, yes. So, thank you very much, Andrew. And um, so now we've got two Andrews today. So, our final new reader for, of the day is Andrew C. Ferguson from Scotland, whose novel The Wrong Box uh, is reviewed on my website, uh, www.zardoth.com, uh, because I enjoyed it very much when I broke my hip a couple of years ago. And uh, that being the case, obviously, this isn't a new novel, but an oldie but goodie. And so let's join Andrew C. Ferguson as he takes us on a tour to Scotland and reads us an ex extract from The Wrong Box. Thank you. Um, thanks, Helen. And uh, thanks for asking me along today. Um, I'm just about to post a, a link. Actually, um, good news for you is that um, if you're able to get the book from Waterstones, it's on offer at uh, a fiver. So um, but you can also get it in um, Amazon and, and uh, um, other good, good bookshops, no doubt. Um, so um, my novel is also kind of crime based. Um, although it's it's kind of if you think of Nordic noir, except it's it's Scottish, so it's got more um, sex and swearing. And sorry, before I started on this, I meant to say I've read Kirsty's book and it is brilliant. It, it is it's basically John Buchan on mushrooms. Um, you should buy it. Um, so you know uh, just just to uh, just to say that. Um, so um, in That's sorry fun. sorry Helen, go on. Ah, oh, you're right. <laughs> Um, so it, oh, it's brilliant. I think um, it's great. <laughs> no, thoroughly, thoroughly yeah. recommended. Um, so um, my own novel um, is set in Edinburgh. <clears throat> um, one of the central characters in the novel, Simon English, uh, is a terrible man, really, but he's a commercial property lawyer, um, and uh, he's um, been having some problems uh, because he woke up. Uh, uh, well, it's posted north from the London office originally because there was a, an, an entirely consensual but um, still inappropriate incident on the boardroom table of his legal firm down south that he was involved in. So he's been posted north to Edinburgh. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't like the Scots um, at all. And uh, he's woken up in the flat he borrowed with um, a dead body in his bath with the toe stuck up the tap. Um, however, this, this is a little bit into the, into the novel. He's just been rescued from a, a dangerous situation by Detective Sergeant Jim Martin, who's investigating the suspicious death of a man um, at the flat. Um, sorry, I'm kind of going over the same thing. Um, so Simon doesn't know whether to trust the police yet, and uh, he's beginning to suspect the death is connected to something much, much bigger, which the police might be involved in. So they talk in an all-night cafe near Leith Docks. Martin sips his black tea with four sugars, looking at me over the rim of the mug all the time like I'm some kid who needs to be told there's no Santa Claus. Here's the thing, Mr. English. 
Commercial property is not the only big business going on in Edinburgh. It used to be mainly drugs this lot were into, but human trafficking is much more profitable for them. Smuggle 10 Romanians in and you've got what you might call a captive workforce, either to work in one of your saunas if they're good looking enough, or sell on to one of the gangmasters for any number of shit jobs that the locals can't be arsed getting out of their beds to do. These guys are big time now, Mr English, at least in Edinburgh terms. They have connections everywhere. Just at that moment, the docker who's looked round at us twice now gets up from the table, avoids looking at us and goes outside, taking a mobile out of his pocket. I decide that it's time to offer something up in this negotiation. Do these connections everywhere include the police then? Martin suddenly sits very still, his eyes narrowing slightly. There's a long pause, but I'm used to holding out in a silence. Eventually, he says, maybe. What makes you say that? The guy who was on the mobile outside has come back in now. Something prompts Martin to look round at him. Again, the guy avoids eye contact. Do you know him? Probably, Martin says and looks at me. Have you finished your tea? I nod and we get up to go, feeling several pairs of eyes watch us leave. When I was at university, there was a friend of a friend had a paranoid episode. Everyone said it was because he smoked too much blow, but and we all did. He was convinced that an ex-girlfriend was following him around. His mate told me they were on a bus once and the guy just got up and got off at a stop somewhere completely random and started running. When my mate caught up with him, he was in a shop getting the shopkeeper to phone the cops. He'd been convinced he had seen the ex-girlfriend sitting two rows back in the same bus. My mate hadn't, of course, but there was no convincing him. Anyway, I'm starting to know how the poor bastard felt as we climbed into Martin's car and set off in the cold light of dawn. As we reach Junction Street and stop at the lights, Martin says, You haven't answered my question. I take a deep breath. Say, hypothetically, a previous occupant of my flat had left a bag of a certain substance, just a small bag mine for personal use only, under the floorboards. Might as well blame Bruce Reed for it now. And say, after your scene of crime people did the sweep, that bag of coke had disappeared. You would know all about it, right? The lights change, and Martin guns the accelerator. Of course. Do you? No. There's another long silence as we head up Leith Walk. Around us, Edinburgh is starting to wake up in a leisurely kind of Saturday morning way. We overtake an early morning bus, then two taxis at Elm Road dawdling along. At the top of Leith Walk, still saying nothing, Martin hangs a right onto Queen Street to take us into the new town. Eventually, he says, do you ken your Greek mythology, Mr. English? Not really. What's coming here? Well, you might have heard of the Hydra, the many-headed monster. Every time you cut one of its heads off, another one grows back. That's what organised crime is always compared to. Personally, I te prefer to think of it as a squid. Ken, the tentacles. As he's saying this, he's glanced once, then twice in the rearview mirror. I guess I see what you mean. And where do you think this one has got his tentacles? Another glance in the rear view. The guy is making me nervous again. I look behind, but all I can see is a taxi one set of lights back. You could well be right that this organisation has an insider in Fetus HQ. I've been thinking that for some time now, to be completely honest with you. But I also think you should be thinking about somewhere closer to home. This throws me completely. What, you mean Bruce Reed? Is that why he had to disappear down south? Martin hangs a right again down Howe Street. Well, what do you think, he says. I think of Tony Hand saying, fuck they, when he heard about Jimmy Ahmed. Al and Bradley cozying up to the two girls as if they'd first met them at Mary Erskine's. And I say exactly nothing. Martin pulls in just above Jamaica Street, the connecting street that will take me along to my car. 
the taxi that was behind us rattles past and then pulls in about 50 yards further down. It sits there, its engine running. Martin turns to look at me. Look, I can understand exactly how you're feeling right now. I've just confirmed to you what you were beginning to find out for yourself, that the entire Edinburgh branch of the legal firm you work for is in cahoots with a gang of organised criminals, and that had something to do with why you got dozed up with a hypno and a guy that ended up dead in your bath. I nod slightly. Okay, he says. You've no particular reason to trust me, Mr English. If I tell you I had nothing to do with your bag of drugs going missing, and that I'm as keen as you are to bring these bastards to book, I understand how you can't take that at face value. He fumbles in his jacket pocket and brings out a slightly battered business card and a pen, which he uses to write a number on the back. As he hands it over to me, we both glance down at the taxi, which is still idling 50 yards further down the street. On that basis, I don't want you telling me where you're going to stay for now. I'll have to report the fact that I picked you up in Ochendrossen, but I'll say that you liked it without telling me where you'd be. When you're ready to talk to me, that's my home number. Call me on that. I nod again. OK. Now, get out of the car, get to your own and disappear for the rest of the weekend. I'll deal with our friend, the taxi driver. The minute I'm out the door of the car, Martin takes off in a squeal of tyres on the cobbles heading for the taxi. Just before I disappear down the lane, I look again and he's dumped the, his car right across the front of the taxi, then sprinted round and wrenched this door open before the guy can reverse back towards me. That's enough for me. I break into a run that would make Usain fucking Bolt get a bit of a shift on and reach India Street in a new personal best. Me and the Lexus get the fuck out of Edinburgh. Destination, Livingston. Thank you. Fabulous. Would you like to unmute everybody? And we will show our appreciation to Andrew. Fabulous. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, everybody. And I'm going to bring this session to a close now with a reading from the Zardoth Imperative Clanship. Um, we're going to join uh, Chaz and Olga from the JSEP Marines in chapter six, as they board a Zardafi ship, which they think is the Bakel in the uh, star system of Declaim. And the Earth ships have sh surrounded the Kameen, thinking it's the Bakel. And the Bakel has been um, uh, taken back, let's say, by the Zardafi children, and they have come to the Declaimy system. Chaz fastened his lifeline to the handhold. Well, oh, what there? Oh, right. Um, Chaz fastened his lifeline to the handhold. Well, we're still to board, Olga replied. Commander Hempel said we need to know who's aboard and why they didn't answer our messages. That could be for any number of reasons, Chaz pointed out. We know it's a Zardothy ship because it looks just like the Bakel, but Chaz, won't they have those translator things? Olga asked. I'd have thought so, Chaz agreed, but explained that the translators took a couple of minutes to assimilate a new language and begin to compute speech patterns. They might need our help or something, suggested Esther. Maybe, Chaz shrugged. He checked the airlock occupied telltale. It was black. In we go then. Olga pressed the switch and the door slid smoothly aside. Weapons at the ready. They crowded in. The outer hatch whispered shut behind them. Air entered the airlock. They watched the pressure rise on the gauge, identical to the one in the Challenger 2, apart from the air pressure measurement units and door telltale, earth ships, green instead of black. The inner hatch hissed open. Chaz saw the figures at the doorway, the Zardothi man speaking into the wall intercom. We've got a welcome! Uh, welcoming committee, Olga yelled, raising her gun and dropping into the firing position. But Chaz reacted faster still. He pushed his stun weapon, weapon back into its holster and raised his hands. We come in peace. He turned to his unit with a drop it gesture. Put your weapons away. Esther, Kenneth and Bjorn lowered their weapons. 
Luigi still held his level. The Zardothi warriors' faces were set and expressionless. Every man or woman held a disruptor levelled on them. Olga hadn't lowered her stun weapon either. Footsteps approached at a run and tension stiffened Chaz's stomach. Shulai, he said. His voice was very quiet and he never knew how, calm, but it shattered the silence in the corridor. Olga, put the gun down. These aren't the youngsters, he whispered urgently. We have to defend ourselves. The footsteps stopped as more warriors arrived. A Zardothi with a grizzled hair crest spoke, not a word of which Chaz understood. After a few seconds, the warrior's throat translator kicked him with, what the seven demons of hell are you doing on my ship? Don't be a fool, Olga. We've barged into their ship by mistake. They have every right to defend themselves. They won't hesitate to shoot and their weapons aren't stun guns. Precisely, said the Zardafi who had spoken before. Your comrade at arms, with a jerk of his head, he indicated Chaz, but spoke to Olga, has more sense than you, it seems. She too lowered, then holstered her weapon, which encouraged the rest of the unit to do so as well. Why didn't you reply to our message? The situation could have been avoided. We haven't had contact with your people before, so our translators hadn't assimilated your language. We didn't understand your messages. Then the Zardothi turned back to Chaz. You know our warrior to warrior greeting, but not our language. How is that? My foster son is Mil, Miril, a Zardothi child from the Bakel, Chaz faltered. I, I only know a few words. Miril Garm, the leader of the Zardothi, stood regarding them thoughtfully. So he, so he is alive. We thought the Bakel had been lost with all hands. So effectively it was. But we found the children when the ship drifted into our solar system and was salvaged. We revived them and raised them in human families. Chaz jerked his thumb at his chest for emphasis. How is Miril? Fine. 13, very bright, good at sports, A-plus student, a pleasure to be around. But the children have left Earth, our planet, in the Bakel, and we've been sent in pursuit. We thought you were them. Wait, you salvaged the Bakel? Is that how you have Zardothi weapons and ships? Something like that, Chaz acknowledged reluctantly. Do you definitely know that the Bakel is in this system? The leader asked. We trapped them here and it's their last known position before the Bakel came to Earth 11 years ago. But if this isn't the Bakel, then where are we? You tell me. The leader made a gesture and the unit was surrounded. Chaz felt a disruptor nozzle pressed against his side. Take the others to holding room one. I'll talk to this one first. Four warriors remained nearby. Chaz swung his head in time to see Olga and the rest of his unit hustled off down the corridor. You really should speak to my chief, not me, he said, indicating Olga. She's the leader of this unit. She's in direct contact with our commander. But she doesn't speak any Zardafi, does she? The leader's mouth twitched. Nor do I. Shula is about the only word I know. It's as well for you that you do know it, the leader growled. Well, human, have you a name? Chaz told him. Are we prisoners? The leader's lips twitched again. Something like that, he said. Under the terms of the Geneva Convention. What's that? Chaz explained. Under its terms and my standing orders, I only have to tell you my name, rank and serial number. The Zardothi leader threw back his head and laughed out loud. <laughs> That's a good joke, he said. You expect us to abide by something we've never even heard of, much less agreed to? No, but I guess you understand what orders mean. The Zardothi spread his hands in the equivalent of a shrug. I don't think your agreement was formulated to take this situation into account, was it? Well, Chaz murmured. If we're not going by the Geneva Convention, how about an exchange of information? Who am I speaking to, for instance? The Zardothi regarded him for a moment or two, considering. Vagar Hesdats, he supplied at last, captain of the Kameen, leader of Clan Kameen. He made a little throwaway gesture, which Chaz guessed was aimed at the absent Olga, and added, your officer there is quite the fire eater, isn't she? Chaz made no comment. 
He'd guessed early on in his association with Olga that she felt she had something to prove to the men in her unit. Let her contact our commander and I'm sure you'll be able to come to some agreement with them. When you didn't reply to our communications, we thought you might be damaged and in need of help and were ordered to investigate. So you came aboard with guns ready to fire? Vega Hezdatz asked pointedly. Well, we didn't know what we were going to find and the guns were on stun. If I allow your chief officer to contact your commander, the Vuff will be on us like a car vulture on dead meat. Even we can't communicate in this situation. Hmm. That suggests other Zardothy ships, and perhaps the Bikel might be here, Chaz thought. A tingle of dread sparked in his stomach. Aloud, he asked, what kind of communications monitoring equipment do the Voth use? We're not sure. We don't even know how they communicate amongst themselves, let alone ship to ship. We use hyperspace communications and we don't know for certain, but we think they could have the same capability, despite the Ki not having a hyperspace drive. Look, Chaz said, we have hyperspace communications too, but we also use laser comms. They're very secure. Where are these Voth? At the other end of this system, but this side of the star at present, so we can't use the Declaney sun to block our transmissions from detection by the Voth. We can encrypt and focus the beam of our laser comms so that they can't be intercepted or decrypted. Oh, I see. Vega Hesdats regarded Chaz with one long-fingered hand clamped around his chin. If that's so, it might be all right for you to speak to your commander. I'm sure we could help you rig something up so that you could use them too, though I'm no engineer, Chaz added. But I don't understand why an advanced civilization such as yours wouldn't have developed them. We're stuck with what our ancestors built into the clan ships four centuries ago. Vega Hesdats gestured to the guards. Take Chaz Lawton to holding room two and bring the female chief officer to me and send Alvis from engineering here as well. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, many thanks. Oh, thank you. And many thanks also to all our lovely authors and readers. That's Kirsty, Raymond and the two Andrews for joining Colin and myself. And... Uh, round of applause for everybody and thank you so much to all our lovely friends and family studio audience for joining us and supporting our readers today and if you'd like to stay and chat uh, with the authors after we finish you're most welcome to join us okay so authors uh, if you haven't put your details into the um, uh, chat uh, please do so or send them to me afterwards um, and I will post them on my timeline and in the finger on the pulse and on my YouTube channel Helen Claire Gould and on my website www.zardoth.com do include prices where to get them and your websites as well. This has been Helen Claire Gould comparing Fiction Fix Online and it's been great to be back actually and bringing new and established writers in various fiction genres to your attention. So thank you so much for joining us. And the next Fiction Fix Online is on Sunday the 6th of June at 4 p.m. till just after 5 p.m. And I look forward to catching up with you then. And just lastly, although Poetry Sandwich isn't running at present, I do hope to bring it back as soon as I can stand up for half an hour. So I'd better write a few more poems, I think. Cheerio for now. Okay, I'll just finish the recording.